Welcome to episode 24 of The Wheelhouse. I am Andrew O. Quick update on my uh, previous cast members, Sterling and Gus, uh, still dead. I am not dead. Um, and that is a notable note because I could have been dead. Because I went on a cruise. I'm now back. home safe. Um, I'm in a little bit of a depressive state uh, as of now, which I'll get to why. But first... Me not dying on a cruise ship. Let's talk a little bit about that. So, uh, the whole trip was maybe five days long uh, out on the sea. This was my first cruise uh, to the island of Bermuda. Or I guess first cruise in general. Happened to go to Bermuda. Not first cruise to Bermuda. Uh, possibly implying that I've been on a hundred other cruises. Just not in Bermuda. Um, and I was very reluctant to go um, initially. And for pretty much all the way up to the cruise because you know I, I've gotten to the point where I've accepted that I don't like vacations in the traditional sense like going someplace tropical or someplace you know some turkey location and just hanging out there um and also I just thought it was a waste of time and I've got to say um the cruise was a valuable experience insofar as confirming uh that yeah I don't like cruises um Okay, let's let's do a little bit of a walkthrough. So we we drive over to the port of Baltimore uh, in the morning. Uh, me, and my parents, and my younger sister. My older sister uh, did not join us. Uh, she was watching over the pets we have, but primarily the reasoning for not going was because uh, she's self-diagnosed uh, as hyd- hydrophobic, which I don't know when that happened or if it's really that severe, but Oh well, um, we're going driving up. See the boat sitting there, looking all pretty. And I thought, you know, that boat's uh, smaller than I thought. Yeah, of course it's big, but I thought it'd be like I don't know, the size of like a spaceship. Um, when we got on the boat, started exploring around. I'd said to myself, "Man, it's bigger than I thought." And yeah, there are a lot of facilities on the ship. There's like a buffet multiple restaurants and bars, there's a casino, a theater for shows, an uh, outdoor pool, an indoor pool, a gym, and lots of other stuff. Um, one thing that I was excited about going in was uh, apparently there's a library. And you know me, I know where all the cool kids hang out. So I made a beeline for the library when I had free time. Found out it's actually not called, it's not a library, it's actually called Book Corner. And it was located on like the the very center of the ship, on the centrum. Um, and when they say book corner, it is pretty much a corner. It's not a walled off space. It is open to the main floor and band and bar. And there's this little cabinet with a glass case with some books that you could take. Um, so yeah, first off, not a library. Um... And I don't, and there's some chairs there, so you could read. But a lot of times there are like people running about there. There's bands playing. There's like dancing. Um, I don't know why anyone would choose to read there. For me, it, it's sort of a trap. I see it as sort of uh, if you if you decide to read in that book corner, you're sort of signaling um, to other people that you're not really there to read. You're there to find other people. Like-minded people who who is not who aren't in it for for the song and dance who are there for the reading, and you're there in the hopes of finding some like-minded individuals. It's like someone who goes to to read a book at a party. You're not really there to to you're not reading to actually read and digest the material. You're there to sort of signal like, hey, uh, I'm I'm not into all this party nonsense going on. Uh, what well, where where are all the the book learning people? Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not about that. When I want to read a book, I'm locked away in my room, which I I did a lot um, on this cruise. And yeah, the room uh, is very cozy. It's compact, but also efficient. She got pretty much everything you need uh, while being while having I guess enough space overall and just having a nice air to it overall. Um, but overall, the cruise experience. I gotta say, I did suffer from a little bit of that that good old loneliness. Um, yeah. Uh, my family went, our whole extended family went. It was something we planned for a long time. But I kind of know all these people, and they're doing off uh, their own thing generally. Um, it's hard to contact and plan things because there's no uh, there's no internet. 
Um, we had some Wi-Fi on some devices, but you're limited to two devices. So it's kind of like, oh, who has internet now? I don't know. Let's try and text people. All well, these people aren't responding, maybe because they don't have internet. So it's really hard to coordinate between groups, uh, and we never really got the hang of it. But yeah, uh, walking around, you get the impression that, man, this boat is full of strangers. Um, how do I, Andrew, meet other people my age uh, into Elton John, Casablanca, and Bioshock? Uh, I don't know, and I never did. Um, and I, I think I can safely say that the uh, 70s music lover, passionate gamer, graphic novel fan, and avid podcaster, Korean-American college film student demographic uh, was an inclusive group uh, with a single member. Um, so it, it wasn't very fruitful to go and try and uh, bring other people to my calls. Uh, there should have been, uh, you know, there's that Bill Hicks joke about the people who hate people club. There should have been a, uh, an event, the, the people who hate cruise club. And, and I think I definitely could have found, found some good people to talk to there. Uh, but there is a, there is actually a teen club, which is the most pitiful thing I think existing on that ship. It's like, I think the age group is like 12 and 17 and, you know, the age group that, that definitely needs the most regimented uh, social structure are teens. Um, yeah, it's pretty depressing. Uh, across from for, across from that uh, location, there was, like, this adventure club for kids. And that's where it's at, man. Your parents just drop you off. You hang out with other kids, playing with blocks and stuff. Man, those were the days. But talking about the, you know, sort of demographical breakdown, uh, it's better than my expectations. Uh, I was very cynical going in because I had, I had seen this like promotional video explaining uh, you know all the different amenities on the ships and things you can do and yeah I watched it and I'm like there are a lot of old white people on the ship pretty much uh, that's that's all I see on this video um, and yeah there are a lot of old white people uh, on, on the cruise when I went on but uh, it, was, it was more diverse there were you know full families people on their own newlyweds uh, people of all ages, um, all different ethnicities. But uh, my cynicism, though, man, pretty strong. It, it inhibits sort of uh, my my full enjoyment of things at times. Uh, walking on a ship, my, my phrase I kept repeating to myself was opulence to the max, which I think I've used that for some other event or something like that. Um, but, you know, walking around, I just assume like, Everyone I bump into is some highfalutin money bag who is there because they're, yeah, super rich and they're stuck up and they're mean and they hate me. Um, and it really didn't help that. Uh, at the time, I was reading The Catcher in the Rye, um, very much emulating Holden's uh, sort of mindset. I just walk around the ship, you know, look at all these, look at all these phonies. Is there anyone here who can, you know, have an intellect, intellectual conversation? But, but when the main dining hall is called the Great Gatsby, I mean, can you really, can you really blame me that much? Um, yes, yeah, yeah, yes, you can. Um, but on that front, the food was actually pretty great. There's this buffet um, that's like open, I think most of the day. The food's pretty good. But then the main dining hall, which is some fancy schmancy sit down, wait for your food after you order on the menu kind of deal. Um, yeah. You wait a long, long time. The full three-course meal is like two hours or something. Uh, But the wait staff is pretty spectacular, um, pretty high class. And the food is actually pretty excellent as well. So sometimes it's kind of uh, worth the wait. But the wait is pretty tough. But after sailing for a bit, we finally get to our destination, Bermuda. And talking about the cynicism come to the conclusion that nothing really wows me anymore there's that jane's addiction album that i don't know what i'm thinking about because i haven't even listened to it but it's like called like nothing shocking um and yeah we went on this little bus ride to a beach just looking at all these pretty uh, pretty vistas and yeah i could i could look at it and say yeah that vista is aesthetically pleasing but was it really worth sailing the atlantic to see it um you know, the the main, I guess, location we visited was this, I think it's called like Horseshoe Beach or something. It's, it's known for its famed pink sand. Um, yeah, it's not really that pink. It's kind of like a, a brownish coral color. 
Um, again, not not something to write home about. Uh, and beaches in general, I don't really get much joy from that experience. Uh, that that sand water combination, don't think it's a good idea. Definitely nowhere near uh, peanut butter and jelly stuff like that. Um, I don't I don't really know what to do myself with myself at a beach. Um, don't like to go swimming in the salt water. Don't like to tan. Don't like the, the sun. Yeah, it's pretty much don't like to get wet. It's pretty much a, a lose lose deal. Um, yeah, it it makes me miss my youth. I'm sure when I was younger, I would have loved to be be there, but the world has broken me down. And now when I'm on the beach, all I do is uh read a book. And yeah, what I really want to do is read some books, watch some movies, play some video games. And when it comes down to it, I don't have to be in a cruise ship to do those things. But earlier, um, I mentioned I was in sort of a depressive state. It's not because that I went on that cruise that I didn't enjoy. I've gotten over that. Um, it's that I played this video game called Tales from the Borderlands. And you might be thinking, well, if, if you're depressed, it's probably because that game sucked or something. No, actually that game is pretty freaking amazing um everyone should play it it's uh developed by telltale games who've done uh walking dead game which is actually my favorite game of all time fun fact um the wolf among us which is great they were also done game of thrones they're doing minecraft right now they're working on a batman one they're they're crazy with all the projects they do and the style of the games if you don't know are sort of uh some people don't call it proper video games it's just dumb but they are um they're like more interactive storytelling where it's not your typical, you know, first person shooter, like you're into action, you know, doing stuff like that. It's mostly these scripted events where you have characters, uh, you know, interacting with each other and your character, you sort of choose uh, what that person says and does. And based on their actions, this is a big, big deal in these games is that depending on what you choose to do, um, people will react differently and it actually affects uh, some of the outcomes in the game. Uh, Wolf, uh, I mean, uh, Walking Dead was the first game that I played that did something like that, and it blew my mind uh, because of its great writing, storytelling, a huge emotional impact, probably the most uh, emotional uh, story I've ever experienced. And really liked Wolf Among Us also. Uh, made me read Fables because I liked the world so much. Uh, and then, you know, I had Tales from the Borderlands for a long time, heard some good things, never got around to it until now. And holy moly, that game is 10 out of 10. Actually, not 10 out of 10. It's almost there. I have a, I have a couple, uh, there's a couple flaws in it, uh, I think. But, um, man, some of that writing is just so spectacular. It is so funny. Um, I would, like, without fail, I would probably be have an audible sort of chuckle or laughter. Maybe every 15 minutes, uh, which is pretty darn good. Uh, video games aren't really known for being funny. I mean, you have like comedy as a genre in books and movies, but there's no real comedy video games. Um, but this fits the bill or gets pretty darn close. Um, some super memorable characters. Um, characters. What's what's notable about this game is that you have two playable characters, uh, Reese and Fiona, and how they sort of frame the story well they actually do a frame story where you have the two those two characters sort of reuniting in a less than desirable situation and they're sort of retelling this past uh, adventure that they had together but they they share it from their own perspective so you know like for example like the first time they meet right Reese will tell how sort of his background and how he got to that point and then you would play as Fiona and see how her background and how she got to that point as well and then when you get to places where they're there together they have sort of differing accounts or sort of embellished details and stuff um and you had them sort of contradict each other or point it, point the uh, any flaws in their story and it's really really neat um but yeah the first couple and, it, and then and if, if you don't know also the game's broken up in episodes when the game was originally released um you would have like one episode which is about a two-hour chunk and you have to wait like a month or whatever. And then episode two comes out. You got to wait again. And then there's five full episodes. Um, I played it when all episodes are already out. So I just pretty much jammed through it over a two-day period. Which, by the way, 
um, the last three episodes I played through in one sitting um, up to like 4 a.m. or something, which I haven't I hadn't done anything like that since I think like a game uh, like Heavy Rain. I think I stayed up really, really uh, late because I was just so into that story. I just wanted to finish it. This one too, man. I, I really didn't want to because I was, I was tired, but I'm like, I really want to finish this because it's so, so good. Um, some problems I had. Um, I actually wanted a little bit more interaction between the two lead characters. A lot of the times they they sort of split them up and like they, they, they make a plan and like, okay, Reese, you go and do this. It's going to do this thing and then Fiona's going to go off and do something else. And they're sort of just intercutting back and forth as you see them uh, do their own thing. But there weren't really a lot of moments where it was really just them together working a lot. I mean, the main place you see them together is sort of the present day frame story when they're talking to each other sort of the story outside the story but I wanted a little bit more there uh, in that same vein I wanted I didn't feel like there was as much uh intimate uh character uh, interactions there's a there's only a couple and especially in like the middle episodes which are a little bit slower uh, they definitely focus on especially in one relationship in particular where there's not a lot of action going on um it's just two characters talking um, I felt like I didn't have enough of that. It definitely felt like this over something like uh, the Walking Dead game. It's, it felt a little more plot driven than character driven, whereas you know Walking Dead I think is does a impeccable balance between the two, where the story always moves along. There's always conflict, but there's always enough time to just slow it down and just have some characters just talk to each other and talk about their lives and reveal things. Um, but man, I cannot recommend this highly enough. It was, I haven't had this much fun with the game in a long time. It was just, um, it was a blast. It was really a roller coaster ride in every sense of the word. Um, visually, uh, emotionally. And opposed to the Walking Dead game, I feel like I, 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 I can go back and play this again. Whereas Walking Dead game... I played through it once, I'm like, that's my... I cherish that that first time experience so much. I'm like, I don't really want to go back and play it. Um, it had that such such an emotional gut punch that I want to sort of preserve that. Or is this? And it was just so much fun that I would love to go back and I wouldn't mind seeing uh, different paths or choosing different things and see how, what the outcomes would be. Um, though I do, I am a little bit, you know, sort of want to... I idealize my first playthrough when I sort of keep that as you know the definitive one but uh it was just su- such a delight that everyone should play it so oh why I'm depressed because it's over and again it got them uh, completionist blues where you're done with the story you can't go back to that world as characters you don't see their antics for a little while um I'm sure there's going to be a sequel if they haven't announced it already to continue the story and man I cannot wait um and yeah, it's like, oh, what's next, man? Got to return to my boring old life and routine recording podcasts when just like five minutes ago I was out saving the world, doing all that stuff. Um, but I'm back here and I got a show to do and I should really move on to my main review. Um, if you don't know how this show works, I'll explain that right now. Um, every week. There's a recommendation, a recommendation for a piece of media, a book, a movie, a video game, an album, anything like that. Um, I go out that week, uh, experience it, come back, and then review it on the show. Um, Today, I'm reviewing another film. Um, This was recommended by a guy named Jake. Uh, It is Good Night, Good Luck, a 2005 film directed by George Clooney. Uh, focuses on CBS journalist Edward R. Murrow and his struggle against Wisconsin Senator Joseph McCarthy. Um, film primarily takes place in 1953. This is in the period of the second Red Scare, when people were scared of everything red, uh, because if it, if it has red on it, it means they're communists. Um, and Joseph McCarthy sort of spearheaded uh, this movement, uh, accusing people of being communists. <clears throat> infiltrating the government um and as we know as history has shown us and has history has not changed um mccarthy uh was a fear monger 
He accused people with no evidence, and he was a complete jerk. But Murrow, he sort of uh, publicly questions and criticizes McCarthy's methods, um, whereas other people were generally uh, resigned to not speaking out uh, out of fear that they were going to be blacklisted by McCarthy himself as being communist, they'd lose their job, maybe face uh, jail time, all that jazz. Um, this film, Good Night, Good Luck, is really good. Um, it's got a beautiful black and white aesthetic, some rousing sequences, particularly some really good monologues. Uh, raises many pertinent and relevant questions, but I, I think it's sort of uh, held back from greatness due to a directionless pace and a weak supporting cast. That phrase, directionless pace, I don't know if that's a really great wording, but I'll get to that and explain what I mean by that. Um, this film, you turn it on, you start watching, right off the bat, uh, makes a really, really, really good first impression. Uh, the black and white looks really nice, looks very crisp. Um, I think the lighting helps immensely. That's one of the biggest reasons why it looks so good. The lighting is spot on. Um, really high contrast at points when it really, really uh, is needed and is very effective. Very moody. Um, gives that slight noir flair uh, that I think helps. Um, this is sort of in, tam- in tandem with the, the camera work, which favors a lot of uh, use of a long lens. So it, there's a lot of there's a focus on a single subject where everything else is sort of uh, out of focus. So using that with some really really uh, stark lighting gives it a distinctive look. In addition, there's a great jazz score and uh, understated wardrobe, and all these elements together effectively sort of capture the '50s era. Um, so that's the beginning, but as the film progresses, we get more into uh, the plot, which is primarily about Murrow and company at the CBS television network, um, sort of start investigating McCarthy and some of the things he's done and putting together these programs, sort of making their case almost to the American public about uh, why what McCarthy is doing is not great. Um, and we see that sort of stylistically... Uh, the film sort of has this combination between uh, what we would get, what we would expect from a fictional drama and with a documentary. Um, the sort of drama aspect uh, it has more conventional framing, sort of shot reverse shot. Whereas uh, the documentary side, there's some sequence, there's some parts where um, you have a little bit more of like handheld camera. It's a little more shaky. Um, some rack focus where you know some someone will be speaking. And then someone else in the frame will start speaking and the, the camera will refocus to sort of uh, go on to them. It's a very interesting decision to sort of use both. Uh, if they sort of abandon doing that later in the film. They, they favor definitely just doing a more conventional uh, sort of presentation, which is unfortunate because it is sort of very unique to, to do that. Um, on the on the performance side, you have uh, David Strait there as Edward R. Murrow, and he's good, pretty darn good. Uh, his sort of performance, you know, portrays Murrow as a very unwavering and serious uh, guy who's very dedicated to his work and takes it very seriously. Um, but he can't admit this sort of artificial, sort of steely cool at times, like just nothing bothers him at all. Um, he always knows exactly what he's doing, and that can come off as a little disingenuous sometimes. Um, um, but there, there are some, like I mentioned before, some amazing monologues, and that's where his character really shines. Um, these are during the sort of news programs that they air live, and you know he's sitting there, ready to go, uh, has a script all laid out, and then you know when when it's, you know when they're on air, he has to he has to deliver, and his performances are always, always uh, so rapturous, um, intense. Um, that feeling of knowing that they're live, you know, and with sort of the whole world watching and also in particular uh, concerning the, the context of, you know, the Red Scare and the possibility of getting into some serious trouble with what they're doing. Um, it is something, it, it is where sort of the most emotional resonance comes out of and these live shows are really the centerpiece of the film 
uh, this sort of general conflict is really on a more conceptual level. It's sort of, a, you know, about the use of media and sort of uh, the battle of ideas, where there's not so much um, these more immediate plot problems like, oh no, you know, all our papers got burned down um, and we need to like write up something really fast. You know, nothing like that. The closest thing to that is sort of uh, th- this sort of pressure that these journalists are getting from their higher ups, both uh, private and public, to to not pursue criticizing McCarthy. Um, it sort of reminded me of, like again, Catch Twenty Two, and also the film Paths of Glory, uh, the Kubrick war film, um, about the sort of frustration and idiocy of uh, you can run into when it comes to uh, bureaucracy and authority. But that sort of leads into some of my problems with this film is that because there aren't many palpable, urgent points of conflict, uh, the pacing sort of falls into a noticeable pattern. Um, you know, you have these Murrow and journalists investigate, right? You, you see them digging up news articles and collaborating and whatnot. Then you get to the actual program where they, you know, set it, set everything up. Um, Murrow sitting there looking all cool, smoking a cigarette. All right, we're live, and then, you know, he does his monologue, interspliced with interviews and archival footage, um, and then, you know, everyone that, that show ends, everyone sort of celebrates, uh, a jazz song plays, and then you sort of see the fallout of whatever that episode did, either a response from McCarthy, or, you know, some people angry, some higher-ups, and... That what I just outlined there is about twenty twenty five minutes, and it, the film sort of does that. That's the whole cycle of the film, and it could, it becomes a little repetitive. Um, and the biggest shame of that that fact is that the monologues lose their power uh, because they are so frequent and expected almost. Um, the the monologues become monotony. Um, I want to go that far as monotony because you know the performance carries a lot of that weight. Um, but it is a little bit tiresome. Uh, and also, um, the film, I think, has a weak supporting cast. Um, this is really Murrow's show, but it, it could definitely flesh out the film world and story if there was uh, better characters to play off of. Yeah, George Clooney stars in the film as Fre- uh, Fred Friendly, who is a co-producer on the show. Very, very passive role. Um, sort of just talks to generally tie things together. I mean, I, I can't really... There, there's not much that he actually does. Um, Robert Downey Jr. and Patricia Clark uh, Clarkson, they're both in the film. They play a married couple who has to uh, conceal the fact that they're married because it's company policy that, you know, two employees can't, you know, be married. They don't really play into the Murrow storyline at all. Um... Really, you, you see them every once in a while talking about, you know, what's going on and stuff. Um, but the real, you know, focus of of, their, of the reason they're there is the the marriage line, plot line, which doesn't really affect the whole Merrill McCarthy thing at all. Um, it's a little baffling. Uh, Jeff Daniels' character, which I don't even remember his name. I don't remember what his character does because he shows up once at the beginning and once at the end. And that's it. Um, the only exception I would say is uh, Frank Langella, who is great. He plays William Paley, who is the chief executive at CBS. And his character is super balanced and fair, uh, and in that respect, complex. Because on one side, he wants to give freedom to his journalists. You know, he mentions that he's never censored any of their work before, but he also has to play as a company man, sort of managing sponsors and producing content that is or will be entertaining to the public um super cool character um but all in all i think uh, a great sign about this film is that after you watch it at least for me i definitely wanted to go and read up on uh sort of this time period and you know the what actually happened between murrow and mccarthy any sort of film like this based off history uh, to to pull that off is a sign that they're doing something right, um, and also there are some a lot of relevant themes that um, sort of stick with you and you think about, it, especially nowadays. You know they talk about how TV can insulate us from the world's problems, 
uh, by being used primarily as a vehicle for entertainment. Where at, when when TV has a great potential to to educate and enlighten. Um, another recent film that this reminded me of was that Spotlight about you know the power of media and what role it serves in uh, when used correctly what great things it can achieve and whereas spotlight I think is a lot better than good night collect because you know there's sort of the the pace sort of continually builds like if it feels like a snowball going down a hill and just gets bigger and bigger as you know more things are revealed and whatnot um they still like thematically they they're very similar um so if you've seen only one of either the film, you should go see the other one because uh, you'd probably like it. Um, and I like this film. It is good. Um, it's short. So, you know, I mentioned how things were getting a little bit uh, dull towards the end. Didn't have to feel that too long. Um, if anything, if they broke out of that cycle and added another 15, 20 minutes, maybe to add some more plot points, that especially... Uh, integrate some of the supporting cast. Um, I think that that would have made this film a lot better. But um, I don't have a time machine, and even if I did, I probably couldn't get a word into George Clooney to to change the film. So that's never going to happen. Um, but yeah, that's good night and good luck. And now, updating you on my state of being. I'm a little tired, so I'm going to whip through this rest of the show pretty fast. Um, got this next segment up with this Jacob guy who is Bruce Springsteen, which I'll play, uh, right now, I guess. I'm here after a semi-long hiatus for me, I guess both of us, because we haven't recorded in a while, but here with Jacob no, again, yeah, for another edition of Who is Bruce Springsteen. How are you doing? I'm doing pretty good. We just drove uh, about 10 hours, and now we're in Tallahassee, and hopefully tomorrow night we'll be in Miami. So, uh, it's you and your family, correct, leaving from Dallas? Yeah. And is this like a vacation thing going uh, on? Yeah, we do it every summer. I mean, we're Cuban, so a lot of our relatives live in Miami. Mm-hmm. Oh, so you go there to, to visit family and hang out yeah. and whatnot. 10 yeah. hours, man. Jeez. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. And you've done this, like, really frequently? Uh, yeah, at least once every year for my entire life. Oh, do you enjoy it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I do, for the most part. It's pretty great. I mean, Miami is a nice place to... It's a nice place to visit. And it's good to see family I haven't seen in a long time. Sure, but for me, hearing your story, the thing I would dread is the actual traveling part. Actually, getting there seems, like, pretty grueling. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is. But I mean, you know, uh, if we're not, um, if I'm not driving, then I'm sleeping. And, um, you know, if I'm awake and I'm not driving, then I'm just listening to music on my phone, which actually I took that opportunity today to listen to the album again while I was in the car. Nice. Nice. Well, you're going to be driving again tomorrow, so maybe you could start listening to the next album, which we'll get to. But first, we're talking about finally on who is Bruce Springsteen that question will be answered with Bruce Springsteen you'll find out because we're talking about uh, the album Born to Run which is his third album oh. generally generally considered his best um, you didn't really know anything about him now and now you've listened to a full album of his uh, what did you think? yeah by the way Andrew uh, I wanted to yeah, ask who is ahead. Bruce Springsteen? oh well I guess I failed if you <laughs> I don't know after listening to his you know that album we're talking about? Yeah, it's, that's him, Bruce Springsteen. Oh, dude. I, I didn't put that together. Sing. I was, yeah. I, was, I was confused, actually. I was wondering about that. Well, now you know. <laughs> and now you can talk about the album you listened to by Bruce Springsteen. Yeah. No, in all seriousness, um, I enjoyed the album quite a bit. Uh, I will say it's not my favorite album. Uh, I still like Led Zeppelin for what's going on and... Um, and uh, Dark Side of the Moon better, but uh, I definitely enjoyed it quite a bit. Um, I noticed what you're saying, which is um, last week when we were talking about the album, you said uh, you felt you had a harder time relating to it when you listened to it because it's kind of written from the perspective of an older, more mature person, like reminiscing and looking back. And 
yeah, all the songs have themes of like being a teenager and falling in love and uh, racing and growing up and all that stuff. So it was definitely written from uh, a bit of a different perspective than some of the other albums we've listened to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I agree. It's from that perspective. It's yeah, lyrically, it's harder to relate to. All like uh, specifically about like the the sort of characters in his songs and what they're doing. But there are yeah. some themes that I I guess are more universal. But um, yeah, I agree. Yeah, and um, I will say though, uh, even though it's from a perspective I haven't experienced, uh, the lyrics uh, they do a good job of of painting the picture. There's a lot of really good imagery in these songs. Um, so even though I felt like it was perspective I haven't experienced, it was one that uh, he he conveyed very clearly. Mm-hmm. Um, Do you have anything to say about uh, the music instrumentally, or are you still focusing on them lyrics? Well, instrumentally, again, you know, I don't know that much um, when it comes to actual, well, when it comes to the actual instrumentals. But I will say, um, I did appreciate like the the direct rock sound uh, as opposed to um, the last couple albums. Uh, um, uh, including Dark Side of the Moon, it's um, it's definitely a stark contrast to some of the other songs, mm-hmm. that, other albums I've listened to, uh, for this for this segment. So I can't say much other than, um, I mean it was, it was enjoyable, it was exciting, it was upbeat, and um, it was just fun to listen to. Do you have any uh, favorite songs? Um, let's see here. Or songs you absolutely hate? <laughs> no, uh, I don't really hate any of them. Um, I would say uh, I really liked Tenth Avenue Freeze Out. Oh yeah, yeah, that song's and, so much fun. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, no, that one's great. Um, and something I noticed that that I've noticed um, after listening to these different albums since we started this segment is uh you know it's not a uh, it's very common for artists um to just and songwriters to just uh occasionally write nonsense lyrics um just to make them fit and bruce springsteen is no exception because um i was reading some of the stuff behind 10th avenue freeze out and you know they were asking him like what does that actually mean he's like yeah i have no idea but it's important yeah it's I, I want to go so, so far as it is like nonsense, but yeah, he doesn't know what it actually is, but it still sounds pretty cool. It does. No, like it just, sounds pretty badass. Yeah. yeah. Any other uh, uh, notable songs? Um. Let's see, I should have taken notes for this one. Actually, I ended up listening to yeah, all man, of them. Yeah, man, you you had a lot of time. You could have uh, taken notes. Okay, well, then I'm gonna say um, I'm gonna say um, which one is it? I think it's night. Mhm. Yep. Is that it? Huh. Uh, yeah, that's it. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I shouldn't take notes. I should have. I'm getting songs mixed up now. Like I have favorites, but I can't remember which ones. Or which ones match which titles now. Okay. Maybe at this point I can take over and talk about Born to Run, the third album by Bruce Springsteen, released on August 25th, 1975. Take up enough of your nonsense. It's my turn to talk. Uh, his <laughs> okay. previous two albums, his previous two albums, Greetings from Asbury Park, New Jersey, and The Wild, The Innocent, and The East Street Shuffle. Um, really long album names, so Born to Run is kind of refreshing. Uh, both of them, were uh, critically acclaimed, but performed poorly in album sales. So Bruce started working on his next album, Born to Run, in 1974 as sort of an effort to break through commercially. And he spent a lot of time and money uh, crafting it. Uh, His production was uh, prolonged, especially because of sort of Bruce's grand design and perfectionism. Uh, He spent six months just on the song, the title track, Born to Run, and it shows... Um, also he was aspiring for this sort of wall of sound technique, uh, 
sort of created by famed producer Phil Spector, where it sort of is this sort of full sound by having a lot of instruments overdubbed over each other, um, and sort of all the instruments together has sort of a unified sort of sound instead of it being like separate instruments. Um, took a lot of time working on that, and also sort of a transitional period. You know, Bruce, this is only his third album, so his songwriting was maturing. Also, his E Street band, his backing band was sort of shifting in personnel also. But uh, the effort was well worth it. It was a commercial success. The album peaked at number three on the Billboard 200. Uh, Bruce made the cover of Time and Newsweek magazine in the same week, which I believe is the only person who's ever done that. Um, And he was called the future of rock and roll by his promotional team, which he hated. Um, But... That, that, that's what happened um, yeah uh, the album going back and listening to it lyrics are great uh, they sort of balance sort of a romantic you know view of Americana with sort of realistic blue collarism um, and I love how a lot of the songs are sort of these vignettes or sort of portraitures of young lovers and strugglers um, and yeah like I mentioned before there are some although we can't sort of relate to sort of what the immediate plot going on there are some universal themes about youth and freedom which sort of uh, still uh, resonate uh bruce i yeah, think well, you've got some power out- themes i was surprised it didn't i was surprised it wasn't uh, just labeled as a concept album well i guess it could but i guess it isn't from bruce's perspective it isn't sort of a concept album there are similar uh, themes through the songs throughout i guess you could argue but I wouldn't. I don't think there's enough of a through line plot for it to be to call to be called that. But you can make an argument. Um, I'm surprised you didn't speak of uh, Bruce's vocals. I think he's got some powerhouse singing, especially on like a song like. Oh uh, yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, yeah. like Backstreets, that growl for the chorus, and also on a song yeah, like Jungle Land, he's very versatile. He could be very you know soft and serene, but also you know, really bring it on the bigger moments. Yeah, and it's very, I don't know how to put it, but I want to say it's very commanding. Like it has, his voice has such a presence to it. Mm-hmm. And I think that it's just it like, also speaks, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's just, it's really strong. It just like really, it, it really fills out the music, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think it, partly because of just his singing is, that like the character of his singing and also just how it's sort of mixed in with the songs, you know, going back to the whole uh, wall of sound production technique. Um, another thing I love about this album, some great song introductions, especially uh, piano intros by Roy B- B- Bidden, something like Thunder Road, super memorable introduction with the piano and harmonica. And a lot of the songs begin with like a piano line and then the full songs kick in. Um, and you cannot neglect Clarence Clemens' killer saxophone solos. Completely typifies the New York sound. Reminded me of uh, Bernard Herrmann's score for uh, Taxi Driver. Sort of that romantic grit of the city streets. And yeah, going back and listening to it, really, really like this album. Still can't say I love it. Um, I think just, yeah, we talked about Bruce's voice being super recognizable and powerful, but I don't. I feel like it's not a voice that just speaks to me in a sense like yeah it's a great singing voice but it doesn't uh i don't love it like you know elton john or stevie one there and that's sort of a thing that yeah. i guess you could just chalk up to personal preference but um and again like we mentioned with the whole uh sort of uh stories going on in the songs that we can't really resonate and i th- also think that's uh, one reason i don't you know hands down love it but i am really interested in going back and listening to his other albums because I have listened to a lot of his other albums, but I've only made like one pass through them. So I really want to go back and dig in uh, to the discography. But um, yeah, uh, any any final thoughts for you, Jacob, on Born to Run? Um, I'll say it was a very solid album. Again, not my favorite so far, but um, I'm definitely glad I listened to it. And it's 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 a very personal album, like. Mm-hmm. I feel like uh, for each of these, uh, for each of the, um, each of the stories for each of these individual songs that, that each of the individual songs tells, it's 
probably has some personal meaning to him, to his own backstory and his own uh, history. I know one of these songs is supposed to be like, um, uh, kind of tell the story of uh, E Street uh, coming together. So I feel like each of these has some personal meaning to him. And I think that makes it a really interesting album to listen to. Yeah, definitely. He's pulling stuff from real life, but also it's sort of idealized, you know, to fit the music. So uh, it's good bounce. All right. That was your first foray into Bruce Springsteen, and you seem to enjoy it. But now we are moving on, because we must do that every week, to our next album. Uh, It is Rumors, the 11th album by Fleetwood Mac, released uh, February 4th, 1977. It is the classic, classic rock album, and one of the greatest selling albums of all time. Uh, It's a perfect blend of pop and rock elements with emotional interpersonal lyrics. Uh, There are some delectable vocal harmonies and very varied musical compositions. And yeah, that's why it's essential. It was kind of a, when we were coming up with this list, it wasn't something that stuck out to me, you know, right away. But then I think Gus, uh, rest in peace, he's dead. When he brought it up, I'm like, yeah, Yeah. no question, stick it on. Um, I, I came up with that phrase, classic, classic rock. I think, yeah, it's just like such a staple, um, that sometimes it is overlooked, but it is definitely uh, an essential worth listening to. Damn, you so, built it up a lot. Uh, I'm sorry, you're probably going to hate it now, but it's good. It's really <laughs> good. I'm excited to go back and listen to it because I know for a fact that I've listened to the first half of the album a lot more than the second half. Because from my perspective now, it wasn't as impressive with the second half. So I'm really excited to go back and give it another listen to see if I, you know, like that second half a lot more. Anyway, uh, yeah, that is it, I think. We are past the halfway mark, and we are, I'm excited because there's some, still some great albums uh, that we have to go through, especially the one after this one. It's pretty great. Um, all right. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Uh, see you, man. And now I got to play this recommendation thing. I um, recorded this really recently, hot off the presses. With uh, my friend Ethan, he's recommending a book, first book. Got to read that thing, and then I'll talk about it next week. Here's the recording. I am here with my good friend Ethan. How are you? Hello. How are you? What have you been doing today? Um, you know, I have recently be- been getting into the um, television medium, as mm-hmm. as one might say. Um, the new channel Viceland is out, and they mm-hmm. have a whole series of new shows that are very authentic and are, are a lot like public radio in a way like, unlocking different like different sets of stories i've heard of this they're is very like, story based so okay. they, they you know a range of different topics is it fiction like, like oh no traditional no TV so they'll, shows? they'll take um they'll take anything and usually it runs under the same sorts of things that vice covers so vice covers a lot of like mm-hmm. criminality but they'll also go into you know um they'll also go into just the more organic topics so they'll pick something like um like modern love and you know it's it's not like this the same sort of like you know covering like heteronormative love but they'll go into like things like topics of tinder and Mm -hmm. other dating apps and just you know it'll it's like very in-depth one show called vice does america and they go out and they like they took a old 1989 like uh, rv and they'll go out and they'll just like cover various things uh, concerning like the upcoming election, mm-hmm. but we're not here to talk about TV. You we're got not. A, you got we're a not. book to recommend. I got a book to recommend. Which will be the first book I review on on the show. Wait, really? Yeah. Oh. I, I think, yes. Yeah. Wow, this is a good book to start out with. Yes. Would you, do you want me to announce it? Or yeah, sure. Go ahead. Your okay. recommendation. So my recommendation is Kirk Vonnegut's The Sirens of Titan, and most people know Kirk Vonnegut for his 1960s. Um. Slaughterhouse Five, mm-hmm. which you hopefully, don't care for. hopefully, this is not a punch in the gut for some people, but I really don't really like that book that yeah. much. Um, most people enjoy the book just because it has a sort of anti-war sem- um, sentiment, mm-hmm. which during its actual, uh, he wrote it during the time of the Vietnam War, mm-hmm. so most people find it, you know, a sort of connection to that, and they enjoy it for that. But in terms of like Kirk Vonnegut, one being one of my favorite authors, particularly just because I like the the satire genre, yeah. 
Um, and I think that him as a writer, this is this first book where he came into his own. You know, I'm, mm-hmm. a, I'm a big fan of his. I read of a countless um, amount of his other works. Um, but this one being his second novel. So his first novel was written in 1952. It's called Player Piano. And that book sort of like people people found it you know it's one of his, his early works you know wasn't necessarily celebrated for it mm-hmm. um but then you know the sirens of titan was written in 1959 seven years later which actually took a while he had a very long career uh, but written in 1959 his second book where people sort of like okay you know yeah. in terms of his his style his story and his his dark humor yeah. and his wittiness and it's getting some notice and like even like uh sync tactically like people found yeah. it appreciated just just because still wasn't his breakthrough his, his style bre- was breaking through. his breakthrough was uh cat's cradle yeah i know it's it, it breakfast of champions yeah. and um and topics of that but um, uh sirens of titan what is it about? Would you like me to go in what I th- what 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 I? Or just like a like an overview, okay. like just general, like hey, here's some characters, like some um, basic plot. You know, I I don't know. Uh, so it follows a guy, and I always I always forget him. It, I they they sort of like use his nickname in the book, but it's it's Malachi Constant. Okay. Um, very strange name, but I mean, this book sort of runs under Vonnegut's traditional style, which mm-hmm. is science fiction. Yeah. Um, though it's sort of interesting because like his science fiction is his own breed. His characters and his styles like usually very simplistic. You know, he's not trying to um, be too cumbersome with any very complicated stylistic elements of mm-hmm. writing, and you know, not very complicated sentences. But usually, like his humor and his wittiness is very yeah. like very fun um and his characters are like very usually very like diminutive and like very um cartoon like Mm -hmm. and that's why the themes that he sort of wrestles with in this book are sort of free will versus um destiny like uh humanity's destiny Mm -hmm. so the book follows this guy who it's like very difficult to t- give you a synopsis without like giving away too much, which is like the most general. Thing. Uh, the most general thing. Are and, there and pirates or are there aliens? Uh, so or? so this guy is uh, f- unlocking the meaning to the human race and un- unknowingly, right? Okay. Um, but he travels around with this woman in space, and that sounds very vague. And you know, the, that's not really that much that much of a part of the book. Like mm-hmm. he's not traveling in space the entire time. Um, there's a lot of things that lead up to that, but let's just say humanity's fate isn't necessarily as free willed as we might think it is. Mm -hmm. And our presence on earth and our, our doings on earth are more, um, manipulated than you might think. And I'm not necessarily speaking to a higher power here. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and I think that, um, the book itself, um, is really fun and i sort of like got into a lot of vonnegut from from this book was this the first vonnegut you've re- you read no it wasn't so i mean okay. i read like anyone i read slaughterhouse five yeah. the first time um back when i was a sophomore in high school so going actually into sophomore year i read it mm-hmm. so then i think the next book that i read was galapagos mm-hmm. um which is really fun and then and then this one and then i've read a few other ones okay. um, but i think this book itself yeah what really what's like makes it stand apart from like the other Vonnegut books and also why like in, in a no, greater no, context no. like why like this book out of and all the other books you love you know honestly I don't think you really understand it till you get to the end where you're like mm. uh like I mean like you know it's it's a lot it's always it's it's always about dark humor and like even um even even a lot of it's the same like you you get the same sense of like fun character fun characters that are like very dysfunctional in their own way if they don't don't realize it or not um and I don't think you you sort of really understand how how like dark the book is <laughs> until you get to the ending. Um, and so, um, and I think that you know you you look at it from a point of view as like, um, I, I don't know I I I don't know where I was going with that, but um, but I mean the the. Even though you, you know, on one side, maybe you're having trouble articulating why you love the book. I feel like a lot of times, 
you know, when I love a movie or a book or a game, there are some aspects like you can't just articulate like why you love it. It just it sort of speaks to you yeah. personally. It has its own sort of register. Um, mm-hmm. And I and I think that when I was reading it, it's be- because of its simplistic style and just because, you know, you can go through it without dissecting in too, mm-hmm. too harsh a light. Um, certain things are, you know, become apparent, almost like thrown in your face. Mm-hmm. And I think that you don't have, as a reader... There, you know, there's there's definitely plenty of people who can be critical about it and they can find certain things. But mm-hmm. I think as a reader, you're just sort of comically given its its secrets hmm. very directly, very mysterious. I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to make this seem as if it's like, you know, it's it's doing it in a sort of like oh, very ceremonial manner. Like mm-hmm. it's just like, oh, here's humans are humans are dumb and 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 we're not who we say we are i don't know <laughs> i don't know. i don't know if that clear do you want me to, do you want me to read the back i'll read it in a very like monotone like very quick voice like the sure yeah okay the sirens of titan is an outrageous romp through space time and mortality I like a good romp. the richest most depraved man on earth malachi constant is offered a chance to take a sorry to take a space journey to distant worlds with a beautiful woman at his side as i've said before of course there's a chance the invitation uh, catch the invitation and a prophetic vision about the purpose of human life that only vonnegut has the courage to tell um so i think that um so a review by esquire on the front cover his best book he dares not only to ask the ultimate question about the meaning of life but to answer it now, when he says best book, did that review come out after this was released? Because then that would mean... I have no be, idea. That'd be funny because it will be two books released. And like, That's I mean, best book. I hate doing this, but for the quantitative-minded on Goodreads, it's got a 4.2 out of 5. <laughs> and it was nominated for the Hugo Award. For some people, that might mean something. For me, it really doesn't. Um, and I think this... Is, it was interesting because I started to write uh, the word satire when I was like, oh, you know, like, I mean, this is just like naturally satire. And I was like, oh, uh, I started to write the word satire and I wrote the word sart, which is interesting because this book is also about free will. Mm-hmm. And I've been reading a lot of like French existentialism yeah. recently. So, but I think he's, you know, Kirk Vonnegut runs a line with the classic Voltaire's Candide, which I love a lot and mm-hmm. would have totally recommended it. Uh, but this is something that I thought of that's fun to read. All right. So, well, I, uh, contrary to you, I actually really like Slaughterhouse Five, and that's only Vonnegut I've read. But I, you, you do really like Slaughterhouse Five. Yeah, I do. Okay, so then I hope, hopefully, that this will be like you know, I hate it. <laughs> or no, no, not that you'll hate it. Where you'll be like, oh, like this is Kirk Vonnegut's amazing. Uh, yeah. Well, you know. I'm excited because I really like mm-hmm. that book. So. Well, if you're definitely interested in this one, then I recommend other ones to you. Galapagos is really fun. Has the same sort of. Um, has obviously the same sort of style, but mm-hmm. definitely the same sort of like understanding of life and evolution. And, um, but I think that it's, it's sort of is interesting. Cause I mean, you, you know, we saw that, that movie recently, um, the, the shout lobster. out to the lobster. <laughs> um, and you were remarking that the beginning sequence and the ending sequence have some sort of significance to the movie. Not always. Um, and I was interested just, you know, I, as a kid, I always like to take the first sentence and run it in line with the last sentence yeah, and always, see if it made, yeah. and see if it made like something, some sort of meaning out of it. Um, and this one starts out with a quote, um, by the main character, actually. It says, I guess someone up there likes me, Malachi Constant. Um, and that's. Also, then it's mirrored by the next sentence. Everyone know, now knows how to find the meaning of life within himself. So it's like free will. Mm-hmm. And then he's saying some sort of overarching power. They run hand in hand. All right. Well, thank you for the recommendation. I gotta, of course. I got to get going so I can start reading this book. Yeah. I got a week, which is, it's not that long, so I should get through it. But Yeah. And for those, uh, those who are looking for it, just look for the yeah. poppy... Purple lavender. Cover. No, yeah. it's, it's lavender. Isn't Andrew. that a type of purple? Yeah, it's like it's like a lavender. So or like a peri- it's like a periwinkle. I'm not wrong for calling a square a rectangle. It's almost like a grayish pink, honestly. Oh, or a grayish purple. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's like a subdued sort of like, um, we'll call it choked pink. Okay. No, sorry, choked purple. Choked purple on like, um, some, like yeah. a pea or pukey sort of green color. Some honestly, some people might find it beautiful. Some people might find it repulsing. Um, 
But then there's a series of eyes. But you should not judge a book by its cover. No, uh, you shouldn't. Although I often do. That's um, fine. It's human nature. Yeah, I mean, you're in the bookstore and you're looking through thousands of pieces of literature and you want to find one that doesn't doesn't kind of suck one that looks fun to read you know um speaking of which i picked up a copy of catch 22 though i cannot finish or sorry i finish start catch 22 without finishing um in cold blood first mm-hmm. oh well so you should finish that yeah i should in cold blood so good but yeah so catch good. it makes me want to like honestly it makes me want to i really really am into like crime now like and yeah. i really it makes me want to watch like the classic like crime noirs mm-hmm. and well there's a truman capote movie with philip Seymour i Hoffman. know in 2005 it's i pretty, have very good. interested in watching it was on netflix a little while it's back good. i don't know if it still is but it's good yeah yeah uh, um speaking of which i'm also about to watch for the first time ever uh, one of my f- like my favorite director which some people might be like uh whatever um wes anderson mm-hmm have Royal Tenenbaums some people say first his time? best film never seen it love mm. love Wes Anderson but Smart. seen a bunch of his other his other titles one time I watched it like two days in a row like, I watched s- it the first day I'm like I love it so much next day I was like I'll watch it again I think that you've said this before but um you do not like Life's Aquatic I don't oh, do you like it I like Life's Aquatic I don't know you know honestly the, I just like zoo, that jerk <laughs> well I mean I, I again recommend you that 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 uh, oh, yeah. YouTube channel. Check out his most recent um, essay on Darjeeling Limited. Well, I'm I'm curious about actually watching it. I haven't seen it, but usually you've I, never seen Darjeeling. I've usually G- considered like try the bottom of his list for as far as yeah. I'm honestly, most people are like, oh, I like I don't like it, but I think that it's such an interesting movie. I mean, it runs under the same like like Wes Anderson's you know, same sort of. Mm-hmm. Care, uh, same sort of character, but I think that it it really focuses on character, which is really interesting because you know, like any of his films, they're, they're like like you said before, like they're very deadpan, they're like very muted characters. Yeah. You can't get into any of them, and I don't I don't necessarily say that I got into any of the characters, but it's about like it's it's different because it's it's not necessarily always about the story; it's about the characters, mm-hmm. and it's about like the intricacies of their life and it's fought it's it's has a preluded um story in the beginning that is uh, coincides with one of the characters um but it's a really interesting film um it has some of the same classic um wes anderson characters in it i keep saying the word characters and i'm being very mindful well, of it that, now that's what they are <laughs> yeah so all right thanks again ethan of course i um, hope you enjoy this book just as much as i did i'm excited Love them, love them eyes that cover, like like the eyes in the cover. Yeah, watching into your soul, or are they your own eyes? One might not know. It's of course, mirror. you don't have three of them, Andrew. I I do have a third eye. You do have a third yeah. eye. Is it a metaphorical, abstract third eye? Yes. One that sees and peers into the world. Yeah. No, as actually, I could see through walls. See through walls. Is it in the front or the back of your head? Oh, it's in the it's in the back. That's why you you haven't noticed it yet. Okay, I'll end on that. Right. Goodbye. <laughs> Thanks again to Ethan for that book. I'm, I like book. I like a good book, but yeah, you know, definitely there's a lot of pressure time wise because I guess in general it'll take longer to consume than a movie or a game, especially if you're a slow reader like me. I like to try and digest what I'm reading. I don't know. Maybe I don't know if I'm a slow reader or not. Actually, don't have anyone to compare to. Sometimes I read fast. Sometimes I read slow. <sighs> I don't know anything, okay? But what I do know is that you should like our page on Facebook at facebook.com slash wheelhousecast. Follow us on Twitter at wheelhousecast. Subscribe to our feed on iTunes where you can also rate and review us. Um, we have an email address, wheelhousecast at gmail.com where you could send in uh, your recommendations or any review or any uh, thing you want to send to me or uh, Sterling or Gus, send your condolences to them. Uh, say they should rest in peace um, in their little graves, which I don't know where they are. I don't know where they are, actually, where they're buried. Maybe I should figure that out. Um, nah, I got too many things to do. <laughs>